around the phenomenon of globalization is as far-reaching and multidimensional, sometimes confused, as in my own country, Sweden, which uh, is always rapid in following American trends in different matters. I don't know whether uh, the uh, discussion has reached the heights is ha here in this country as it has in Stockholm recently where there was an acrimonious exchange on this subject between the leader of the Christian Democratic Party on the one hand and the Archbishop of Sweden where they uh, were, were um, attacking each other for being dishonest. Um, but at the same time, the extensiveness and sometimes vagueness of the notion is not always helpful in understanding the processes at hand and the outcomes at hand. As an example of how fashionable and omnipresent the buzzword was uh, mentioned earlier, the notion of globalization has have become, I would like to tell you the following episode from this summer. This summer, my children and I, we went to the beautiful Swedish island of Gotland in the midst of the Baltic Sea in order to bike. In the harbor of Visby, the medieval Hanseatic capital, together with some friends, we went to a quite simple trattoria-like restaurant and ordered today's salad. To our great and pleasant surprise, we were served an absolutely delicious dish, the gastronomic quality of which by far surpassed the setting of the place. We started to discuss how this marvel was possible, and then somebody in the company came up with the obvious answer, it must be the globalization. <laughs> the answer, however, was similar to the answer given by a lawyer in one of the innumerable American stories about this profession, that is, perfectly accurate and absolutely useless. In economic terms, the good we were enjoying was the result of trade in goods, in particular high value per unit of weight goods like spices. But the salad was also a function of imported intellectual property in the form of production, production method, the recipe. If trade in goods and services influenced the supply side in this transaction, the uh, supply was stimulated by the demands supported by the purchasing power and culinary sophistication of the crews on board the elegant yachts in the harbor, branding Swedish, Danish, German, Polish, and Estonian flags. In this sense, the answer contained many of the elements of what is covered by the notion of globalization. At the same time, all this, the trade in goods, services, and tastes, or preferences, is not, to put it mildly, a new phenomenon. Even if the development of transport technology and communications, particularly, of course, the Internet, uh, have changed the volumes and intensity of the trade flows by several orders of magnitude, we can be pretty sure that spices and other goods valuable enough were traded already in the centuries when the Roman and Arab coins were brought there and which now are regularly unearthed on Gotland. As many economists have pointed out the degree of globalization, quote unquote, was as great or even more extensive in relative terms at the beginning of last century as they are now. For example, investment flows from Great Britain reached a level which exceeded the kind of flows we re register today in the, at the beginning of the last century. Not only mobility of capital was higher due to the lack of capital controls, but the mobility of labor was much greater too as the migration waves from Europe to this country show. And the international movement of ideas go further back in history, back at least to the Renaissance. To a certain extent, I suspect that the very wide and encompassing application of the word term globalization is not very helpful, because it bundles together different de developments and problems which are better analyzed and hopefully solved independently. For example, the same level of income per capita can be associated with different levels of environmental consciousness or even stress or degradation. The same is true for the degree of cultural autonomy, where philosophical or religious attitudes can make the respective country more or less resistant or open to globalized trends. The homogeneous and uniform character of the globalization process is also often overstated 
even when it comes to relatively easily measurable phenomena like trade flows. I, give, I will give you an example. The trade flows are sometimes analyzed by the so-called gravity model, which is built on the relatively simple and commonsensical thought that bilateral trade here we have it. That bilateral trade flows are determined by the number of people in the two countries, their respective per capita income, and the distance between the two countries. If we uh, will be able to, you have the national income of country J, you have per capita income in that country, and the same for the other country, and uh, the level of uh, uh, income is positively correlated with uh, trade. The, this, the uh, um, per capita income can bo work both ways and the distance is, uh, is uh, of course a negative factor. This simple model explains why Sweden's trade with neighboring Norway, some five million inhabitants, is as, uh, as large as with the United States, some 270 million. Uh, inhabitants. Uh, you can uh, make this model more refined uh, by taking into account common trade regimes, common or similar languages, uh, and whether t two countries share a border. If one takes the average degree of integration and trade interpenetration in the OECD countries as a yardstick, it's possible to get quite interesting, even surprising results. Now, one is the OECD average when these factors have been taken into account, uh, GDP, GDP per capita, and, and distance. And uh, what is interesting to see here is that the, if you take EU as exporting block to NAFTA, the ratio of trade integration is below the OECD average. And uh, the same goes for if you take NAFTA as the exporting partner to the EU, the, the level is uh, far below uh, one, uh, whereas uh, the trade integration between uh, Na Asia and NAFTA is, is much higher. Uh, and, uh, and surprisingly enough, the trade integration between EU and Asia is, uh, is higher than, than the average. Um, and this um, uh, is rather surprising, at least for a Swede, result that the transatlantic relations are not as intensive as the other connections in this triangle. Um, the reasons for this is, uh, is unknown to me, but one suspect would be the trade diverting effects uh, of the regional trade integration in the EU that these trade diverting effects are so, so strong that they dampen the trade creating effects of the growth of GDP to a measurable degree. This is also an example of the fact that globalization is far from as homogenous and all pervasive as is sometimes claimed and that a lot of globalization is a quite regional or even local in character. Coming back to the notion of globalization, I think there is a problem that so many different issues have been brought together under one single heading. This makes it easier to perceive and depict something which in itself is a positive and even highly desirable development as a deterministic, almost totalitarian march of the history-like process, and therefore easier to vilify and demonize. With all this, with this all-embracing brand or set package of political ingredients, which you either have to take or leave. It's easier to, for example, see environmental degradation as a necessary and unavoidable consequence of trade liberalization, which of course is not the case. Even uh, if I'm fully aware that my view will never have any wider support, I think that the word global ought to be uh, or have been reserved to denote phenomena which are truly global. That is covering all of us here on Earth, for example, the global warming about which I will comment later. For most other developments, it would be more meaningful to apply terms like international economic, political, technological, and or cultural integration, all of which have a long and varied history. <laughs>
With your permission and from the vantage point of a small, traditionally highly internationalist country, I venture to suggest that the great attention devoted to globalization is strongly influenced by the fact that the US, world's biggest economy, is undergoing great structural changes at the same time as it's becoming more integrated into the, into the world economy through the increased shares of trade to GDP and large flows of foreign capital into the US economy. The ensuing social changes, even if they're predominantly driven by domestic factors, tend to be associated with the opening up of the economy. And I could add that the protectionist pressures one can see despite the low level of unemployment in the US is something that often, often appears as a consequence of a high or overvalued exchange rate. Turning now to economic integration as such, there seems to be few relationships in the economic sciences which have been so thoroughly demonstrated as the link between trade and the growth of wealth, beginning of course with Adam Smith. But of this matter, practice by far precedes theory. I do not intend here to describe the economic history of the world from the Phoenician trade system around the Mediterranean Sea some 3,000 years ago to our days, but in the light of the current isolationistic trends and also to underline that the phenomena covered by globalization have a long history, it could be of a relevance to see what role the rest of the world played for a country like Sweden. If you limit yourself to the modern history of Sweden and disregard the great tradesmen, the Vikings, and start with the very foundation of the modern Swedish state, it actually can be said to have begun with an operation on the international capital markets. In the first quarter of the 16th century, Gustav Vasa, the grandfather of Gustavus, uh, turned to the Hanseatic League in Lübeck, in Germany, where he borrowed in order to finance his war against the Danish king. And it was the victory in that liberation war which created the Swedish state as we know it today. We might add that as many later investors in emerging markets, the gentlemen of the Hansa made a bad investment. Not only were they never repaid, but in addition they were squeezed militar militarily and politically out of business by the young upstart they had helped. In the 17th century, trade played a decisive role in financing this Swedish short-lived period as great European power. Sweden was the major European export of iron and copper, as all warring parties in the Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 1648, used these metals. The demand for these goods grew proportionally to the action on the battlefields, thereby replenishing the Swedish treasury. In this way, the Swedish army could be considered as a self-financing machine. Not only trade with the domestic natural resources was of great importance at that time, Economic integration also took the form of foreign direct investment and transfers of technology through Dutch investments into the mining industry. Important movements of people in the form of Wallonian experts in mining and metallurgy also contributed to strengthening the Swedish economy. In the 18th century, modern international scientific inter interaction began with the creation of the Royal Academy of Sciences in the 1740s, and Sweden was plugged quote unquote, into the global, quote unquote, intellectual system which developed within the framework of the Enlightenment with prominent Swedish scientists like Linnaeus, the botanist, Celsius who created the centigrade system for measuring temperature, and Scheele who discovered oxygen. When Sweden became ripe for the industrialization almost a century after its beginning in Britain, the underlying driving forces were the expansion of the system of education in the 1840s that is, heavy investments into human capital, to, to put it in economic terms, and the very pervasive liberal reforms of the legislation governing business and industry in the 1860s, which created a new growth-friendly system of defined property rights. But foreign direct investments also played an important role in the form of very large British investments in the construction of railroads across the country. In the event, the British, to a certain degree, shared the fate of the gentlemen of Lübeck. The British had extended long-term fixed interest loans denominated in Swedish kroner, the real value of which was strongly eroded during the First World War and ensuing wave of inflation. <laughs>
Looking at the scientific and technological fields at the beginning of last century, Sweden was strongly dependent on Germany, the UK, and increasingly on the US. From around 1870 to 1970, Sweden registered the highest average annual growth rates after Japan and was turned from one of the poorest to one of the richest countries of Europe. And we've been talking about developing countries. One could be reminded of the fact that um, at the beginning of the last century, the uh, life expectancy and child mortality in Sweden was at the same level as in present-day Tanzania. And a, a driving be force behind this whole development, which I've tried to, to sketch here, is, uh, is the increasing openness of the economy. And today, of course, uh, Sweden uh, seems to have recovered some economic health, and uh, we are very proud that we, uh, we uh, Stockholm is the uh, internet uh, capital of Europe. But again, a, a very decisive factor here is uh, the two factors that uh, young Swedes uh, understand English quite well, and second, that they have to a higher degree than, than uh, their European colleagues established contacts in Silicon Valley. But an open economy th the, of the small size of Sweden is of course vulnerable to the shifting trends of demand on the world markets which lead to exogenous shocks to production, employment and incomes. It is therefore not very surprising that the level of social expenditures and publicly organized welfare systems have tended to be higher in a number of smaller European countries, even if this trend has been most pronounced in the Nordic countries. The development of an ambitious social safety net has been a necessary corollary to the policy of trade liberalization, even if the extent and design of the welfare system, as it looks today, is subject to criticism from the academic community and to a lesser degree controversy in the political arena. The main points of criticism concern the unnecessarily high deadweight losses due to the high tax wages and unfocused distributional effects of the transfer system as a whole. I ventured into this very brief overview of Sweden's economic history in order to put the traditional Swedish, and for that matter my own, positive attitude to international economic integration against the background of the profoundly positive experience we have had of the policy of openness. If the proof of the pudding is the eating of it, then internationalization has been delicious, at least to us Swedes. From this position of strong support for an interest in further liberalization in the international economic field, the present state of affairs at the level of international economic diplomacy and negotiations is highly unsatisfactory in several respects. The remarks I'm going to make could well be put under the heading borrowed from Axel Uxenschana. The remarkable Prime Minister and Chancellor of the Treasury who served for more than 30 years in the 17th century under, among others, Gustavus Adolphus. And I would add Gustavus Adolphus wouldn't have half the size he has in, in Swedish history if uh, he hadn't had uh, Axel Uxenschana as his Prime Minister. Uxenschana formed the society and the economy in a profound way that left traces in Sweden until our days, and he was a major player at the top level of European power politics. In a letter to his son at the end of his life, with all his experience accumulated, he wrote in the globalized language of that period, that is Latin, Nescis mi fili quantilla prudencia mundus regatur, which means, you don't know my son, with how little wisdom the world is governed. <laughs> first-hand witnesses as such. A first matter of great concern is the slow pace if not stalemate in the international trade field, symbolized by the breakdown of the Seattle Conference of the WTO and the lack of progress to launch a new round of negotiations. Now, what factors do explain that trade liberalization, which has been an important, even decisive factor behind the growth of the OECD uh, countries' economies for most of the post-World War II period, has come to a halt? If one will believe the mass media is to be credited or blamed on the anti-globalized protesters in the streets of Seattle, 
In itself, it's a remarkable and regrettable fact that the extra-parliamentary groups or NGOs uh, should be allowed not to express their views, that's obviously their right, but to, to uh, deroute the, uh, the process of negotiations and decision-making by governments that at least in trade-weighted terms are predominantly democratically elected. However, on closer inspection, the Seattle meeting was doomed already before it, is, it was started, and this for several reasons. The main reason was that the differences between the positions of the main actors were too great on almost every major issue. Even within the group of rich industrialized countries, which had been promoting the Eurogown round within the GATT in the 80s, the divergences were very deep on issues like rules for investments, competition, as well as regarding the degree of linkages to be made between trade and environmental concerns. Before the meeting in Seattle, the Quad, that is the United States, EU, Japan and Canada, had been publicly pushing for liberalizations in several fields, but were totally unwilling to discuss issues that are politically sensitive at home, like agriculture, textiles or anti-dumping practices. The collapse of the meeting was also facilitated by insufficient preparations in advance. Here it's instructive to compare with the relatively successful Uruguay round. In the mid-80s, the differences and distrust between the major actors were also very great, but that the initiatives by some smaller free trade-minded countries like Switzerland and Sweden, an informal group of delegations, the so-called G47, uh, was formed in Geneva, which discussed and prepared a draft mandate for the launching of the Uruguay round. Without that groundwork, the Punta del Este conference, which started the Uruguay round, would have, have gone the same way as the Seattle conference, or vice versa. Had Seattle been better prepared, it could have been more successful. In any case, the result of the collapse in Seattle has at least three effects. First, a strong impression of defeat for the trend to liberalize has been created, and this after the collapse of the MIAI uh, negotiations at the OECD dealing with rules for investment. Second, the negotiations are rather, or rather talks which have been started on the so-called built-in agenda or leftovers from the Uruguay round in the field of agriculture and services will be deprived of momentum as they lack the, the uh, political will and they lack deadlines and specific goals. Third, the absence of, of political pressure from the multilateral system uh, leads to to greater difficulties in reforming the EU agriculture policies before the enlargement of EU to the candidate uh, countries in Eastern Europe. Um, I will, um, I will uh, comment this in a moment. In the resumed trade talks in Geneva, it's necessary tr to try to show real political will to make progress. This could be facilitated by a number of confidence-building measures in the agriculture and service field. But there is also an, an urgent need to start a, build a, a, a common ground between the major players. Um, and uh, that must be built on some kind of reasonable compromise uh, where one would include both a, uh, elements of a total approach linking all different areas together in one single undertaking but at the same time taking into account the difficulties of the developing countries to, to uh, enter on such a platform. Finally, a general remark about the intellectual logic of the negotiations within GATT uh, uh, earlier and now WTO. It's built on an atavistic system of thought, namely the mercantilistic view that the ultimate good is to export, whereas imports is something bad. A lowering of tariffs or elimination of impediments to investments which lead to cheaper and or better goods and services in your own country are presented as sacrifices, concessions which have to be traded against other countries' concessions. As even liberalization in isolation is profitable for a country, this logic amounts to saying that I will stop shooting myself in the foot if only you will stop shooting yourself in your foot. Intellectually, and the, from, from the point of view of the level of development of science, this is as if an international medical conference today 
would recommend diagnostics of human patients by inspection of the livers of birds or frogs, like the augurs used to do in ancient Rome. The reason for this absurdity in the trade field is, of course, the need for governments to get sufficient leverage from the gains in one sector in order to break down resistance to change by vested interest in other sectors. Now, this brings me to a subject which I think has not been given sufficient att attention, and that is the real costs of special interests. From the point of view of democracy, special interests are, of course, absolutely legitimate as democracy is about, among other things, freedom for all citizens to organize themselves in different groups and constellations in order to promote common ideals, ideas and interests. But at the same time, there is a risk that such organized groups will exert a disproportionate influence where the more or less legitimate fight over resources is transformed from a zero-sum game into a negative-sum game for the society as a whole. My conviction is that what we are witnessing today is precisely a very costly negative sum outcome as a result of the influence and political power of certain special interests. I know that the question of campaign financing has become a serious issue in US politics, but out of courtesy, I will confine myself to the experience with special interests we have in the EU. My, the most striking example of the influence of special interests is, of course, the common agricultural policy. Almost half of the budget of the EU and large amounts directly extorted from the consumers through artificially high, high regulated prices are spent to support the farmers allegedly in need of support, even if there is no statistical evidence showing that the farmers on average have lower incomes than other groups, rather the contrary. However, as the subsidies directly or indirectly are tied to quantities produced, about 80% of the subsidies accrue to the 20% of the farmers with the highest incomes and with wealth far above the level of the average. An increase of food prices has a regressive distributional effect among consumers too. So both in consumption and in production, the result of policies is that the unevenness of income and wealth are reinforced. This perverse effect, however, comes at considerable cost. A recent study puts that cost as slightly less than 1% of GDP per year, considering that the active farming population of the EU has shrunk to a couple of percents of the total, the level of subsidization is very considerable. But the help to those working on the farms does not reach them, as the subsidies tend to concentrate on the least mobile factor of production, in this case land. Therefore, the farm subsidies mainly contribute to maintaining or increasing the land rent to the benefit of bigger landowners. But the costs do not stop here. You have to add the strongly negative effects on, in, on the environment, which uh, Yagdish Bhagwati already mentioned, of the high intensive farming techniques in Europe, with high inputs of fertilizers and pesticides, which are driven by the high level of subsidization. And on top of that, the developing countries and certain industrialized countries with comparative advantages in agriculture are both denied access to the EU, mark, EU markets and subject to the devastating effects of the EU dumping of its surpluses on the world market. This is particularly negative for the growth potential of a number of developing countries, of course. Agricultural protectionism was one major issue and a stumbling block in the Uruguay round. In the 1990, the whole round almost broke down and was saved later by the Blair House Compromise, which marked a certain standstill in the subsidization war between the major trading partners. More profound liberalization was postponed to the next round of negotiations. That's the one which broke down in, in, in Seattle. This, um, this table shows you, however, that the agricultural lobby in the EU has been quite successful in man maintaining and even increasing the level of subsidies in terms of producer subsidy equivalents, which measure all kinds of support the farmers receive as percentages of the total revenues from agricultural produ production. Now, this is a rather strange measure in itself. If uh, 
I would have $100,000 in income and I get a subsidy of $100,000, I would say well, I've got 100%. But that would be a too high figure. So instead you have PEC which says 50% of my total income is, is, uh, is uh, a subsidy. Uh, so um, actually uh, uh, what we see here is uh, uh, during the 90s the, uh, the uh, subsidization level even measured in this benign way has, has increased in the EU. And further, um, at present the cap, I think I have a, a diagram which uh, shows the relative levels of, of subsidization, or again in PEC terms, uh, in uh, different countries and areas. And uh, from that you see that the uh, United States is somewhere between 20 and 30 PSEs, uh, which is then, the difference is actually larger. The, the difference is between 50% subsidization in the U.S. and almost 100% in, in the EU. Uh, the uh, top levels are attained by, by Japan, Iceland and Norway for some reason. Um, but the costs do not stop here. At present, the cap is the main impediment for the entry of the democracies of the Central Europe into the EU. The problem being particularly intractable in the case of the largest of the candidate countries, Poland. The political problem consists mainly of the fact that the successful rent seekers, the farmers in the present EU, do not want to share their pie with the newcomers within a given cap budget or within the present price level. The EU politicians, however, are not willing to or able to devote more resources from taxpayers and or consumers which would accommodate both the old members of the Farmers Club and the new members. And finally, the peoples of Central Europe with per capita incomes far below the EU average and accordingly spending a much higher share of their incomes on food are less than enthusiastic to have to see their food prices soar to the present EU level. At present, the outlook is for either the enlargement being substantially delayed or the candidate states being forced to accepting terms which would be, be not only very onerous in the present but would also prejudice the future growth potential of the economies at large by binding resources in agriculture when they could come to better use in other sectors. The third and rational alternative, a reform leading to a dismantlement of the cap and a transition of agriculture to the same rules of the game as for other sectors of the economy does not seem to have a very high probability. Now, I would like to give you another example of Uxenshana's wisdom, which brings us from the morally questionable to the realm of the outright absurd. I'm thinking of a particularly both ridiculous and damaging policy, and Jagdish already mentioned it, which is the result of lobbyist pressures, that is the EU protection of bananas. The proclaimed and alleged aim is to help poor growers of bananas in the old French and British colonies in the Caribbean. In order to achieve this goal, a complicated system of quotas and tariffs has been set up in order to protect these producers from the more cost-effective competitors in primarily Central America. However, the result is that the price to the EU consumers is considerably increased, but only a small fraction of the foregone consumer surplus does turn up as an increase in the producer surplus of the EU banana producers. Actually, different estimations put the cost to the consumers at around 2 billion US dollars, out of which something like 150 million US dollars reach the protected growers, which means that it costs 13 and a half US dollars for the consumers to transfer one dollar to the growers. The major part of the rest lands as a nice monopoly windfall gain with a limited group of European wholesale traders who manage to get allotments of import quotas. The cost due to this way of subsidizing the probably quite well-off owners of wholesale trading companies is again only part of the total bill. To get the grand total, you will have to add the protracted legal battle in the WTO between the EU on the one side and the US and the Latin American banana ex exporters on the other side. A special panel of the WTO found the US scheme was against the WTO rules and ruled in favor of the US 
and, uh, and others. But that did not stop the EU from continuing its banana policy. Then the US took countermeasures against different kinds of EU exports, which added further to the total cost of the policies through higher costs to the US consumers and lower income for certain Europeans who have nothing to do whatsoever with bananas. At the political level, the effect, effect is to create antagonism between the two major trading partners with a souring effect on the whole climate for trade negotiations. And finally, the political legitimacy of the EU, the re representatives of which are constantly proclaiming that the UN, U Union primarily is a legal system loses quite some credibility when it so openly disregards the rule of law within the WTO framework, an international treaty the Union has acceded to. Another blatant example, and I have to use the, uh, the uh, expression by Jeff Sachs uh, yesterday, it's a factoid, uh, uh, this is, I haven't read it, I've uh, gotten oral reports about the following story an example of, uh, of uh, the wisdom with which the world is governed. And that's the case of EU tobacco policy in Bulgaria in the beginning of 1990s. As you might know, the EU has within the CAP a program for subsidizing tobacco growers, thereby stimulating the production and supply of this good. At the same time, the EU, the enlightened part of the EU, like your Surgeon General, uh, has found that tobacco is hazardous to health, and not as uh, smart and uh, fashionable as it was in, in the uh, late 18th centuries when this nice picture was made. Uh, so they, uh, they have uh, supported campaigns and regulations in order to limit the consumption and demand for the, this same good which is the production of which is stimulated. So the EU steps on the gas on, and on the brake at the same time. As this does not square quantitatively and also due to the lower quality of the European tobacco, it has problems in the EU marketplace. The ensuing surplus is then dumped on the world market. Now Bulgaria has a very long tradition as a tobacco producer and its main market was the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc. When the Soviet Union disappeared and the Marlboro Man and his likes victoriously rode into every major Russian, Ukrainian, etc. city, the main market of the Bulgarian tobacco industry almost disappeared. But it, as if that had not been enough, the domestic Bulgarian market was flooded with EU surplus tobacco. When the Bulgarians wanted to take protective measures on this account, the IMF did not allow them to do that. The, resu the result was that a very tough adjustment had to be performed by the Bulgarian tobacco growers, many of them belonging to the Turkish minority, thereby contributing to the ethnical tensions in Bulgaria. In the event, many of them had to emigrate to Turkey. This kind of policies have to put, be put into, into the context of the enormous tasks facing a country like Bulgaria when it comes to transforming its economy and creating a Bible democracy on the ruins of the Soviet system it belonged to and also seen in the context of the relative economic capacity to alleviate the necessary downward adjustment of the tobacco industry in the rich EU and in the impoverished Bulgaria, respectively. Still another case of lack of wisdom, or rather successful lobbying by special interest, is the restrictive measures applied to its Russian exports during the 1990s. The Russian, for all practical purposes, Soviet economy, did not have many civilian goods with higher value added, which could be competitive than the world market. The few they had, like aluminum, chemical fertilizers, cement, and seamless steel tubes, were, however, almost without exception, subject to different trade restrictions, preferably at the intransparent and particularly damaging kind, like QRs and anti-dumping duties. Strangely, enough, it was precisely the last percentage of total supply to the OECD markets of these goods that came from Russia that was considered to destroy the price formation. And this, at the same time, as a lot of political capital and financial resources, a lot of rhetoric, were invested by the same Western governments which had put up these barriers in assisting the transformation of the Russian economy from the militarized Soviet structure to one which could be better adjusted to the demands of the civilian, domestic, and international market. I've given you some eloquent partial examples of the protectionist policies in the EU, 
the total cost for some 22 sectors in terms of foregone GDP has been estimated by Professor Patrick Messerelin of the uh, S S uh, Institute for Political Sciences in Paris, the Sciences Po, to be to order of between 6 and 7 percent of GDP, or between 30 and 40 percent of the output of EU goods every year. According to his results, the average cost of saving a job by protectionist measures is some 230,000 US dollars, which is 10 times higher than the average wage in the sectors concerned. These are, of course, very high figures, which the general public is not aware of. And his study also shows, it is forthcoming, it's not published yet, he shows that much of the wanted globalization in the trade field in the 1990s is, is highly overrated. The tariff reductions nego negotiated during the Uruguay round have been more or less offset by the introduction of anti-dumping measures of, the, of some kind. From the Swedish experience, I can only point to the fact that when we entered the Union, we had zero anti-dumping rulings. Now we have something between 80 and 90, and they have been established by the, the EU Commission. Coming back to Mr. Lens' figures of 6 to 7 percent of GDP, they do not include what I would like to call the political multipliers, which you have to include into the bill for the protectionist pleasures. What is the opportunity cost of a further delay in the integration of, of, <coughs> of Western and Central Europe and the ensuing lo lower growth in that part of Europe? And what are the costs in terms of greater political and militarily in military instability in the whole region and the consequences for our ability to solve the truly Herculean political task of integrating Russia into the world economy in a not too distant future. And looking westwards, I've already indicated the unmeasurable but quite real costs of European protectionism in terms of prospects for regaining the momentum for cooperative transatlantic strategies in the trade field. As I mentioned, I've been limiting myself to elucidating some aspects of protectionism in the EU. For those free traders in this audience who have been thinking of parallels in the US, I can give reassurance. According to Professor Messerlin, the level of border protection is almost the same in this country, even if its domestic neg negative effects are dampened by the livelier competition among the producers in the domestic market compared to the conditions in the EU. So there is a target waiting for you too. And uh, both Jeffrey Sachs and, and uh, uh, no, both uh, Joseph Stiglitz and, and Jagdish Bhagwati have, have mentioned a number of examples here, of course. The facts I've been describing to you can be useful, including into the present discussion about the poverty in the world. It's obvious that the rich countries would be able to reallocate resources to increase the official development aid by reducing the extent to which the public budgets or other instruments are used to transfer money from the poor or poorer to the wealthier. Even a fraction of the cost I've quoted would be sufficient to double the level of official development aid, which today, as an average in the OECD, is approximately 0.3% 0 .3 of GDP, uh, and that, in its turn, is, is only uh, four-tenths or whatever of the official UN goal of 0.7%. It's also a striking fact that one does hear precious little from the anti-globalizers about the effects of the rich world's protectionism on the poor of this world. Their credibility would be considerably enhanced if they cared to devote somewhat more attention to the distributional effects of special interests at home first, before blaming the liberalization of trade for all possible negative phenomena in today's world. As we all know, charity begins at home. Now, once you realize the role and influence of the special interests, the next question is, what can be done to change things? In principle, one can distinguish between three approaches. The first one could be termed the conservative one and consists of limiting the public sector's role in the economy as much as possible, thereby limiting the domain over which the special interests are able to wield their influence. 
In this night watch state, only the basic public goods are delivered through the government, and even if special interests might have an influence on these functions too, the damage would be limited. The liberal, in the European sense of the world, word, you tr in that model, you try to contain the rent seekers by strict regulation of the integrity and, the, and the independence of government officials combined with tr transparency. In this way, excessive abuse of political power would be exposed to the general public and politicians called to order by the same public. A third model could be distinguished as the Scandinavian, but also other social democratic regimes where, uh, where certain special interests, like the trade unions, have or have had such a broad membership basis as making them willy-nilly interested, not only in their particular group interest, but in the general interest too. The government strategy has been, in those cases, one of including the special interests into the decision-making sufficiently as to influence them through modification of their priorities. Of course, what you see in the real world is a combination of the three approaches. My own experience is from the agriculture reform that the Swedish government launched at the end of the 80s, and which was later undone completely as Sweden entered into the EU. However, the reform is still of interest as it demonstrates that it's possible to implement a far-reaching reform in a thoroughly subsidized sector, mainly by mobilizing the general public. In contrast to the other, even more far-reaching agriculture reform of that period, the one implemented in the New Zealand, the Swedish reform was not enacted out of compelling macroeconomic reasons. Sweden could afford, as it does now, to go on spending huge resources on a perfectly irrational policy. But out of rational reasoning and the general increasing understanding for the need to de deregulate different sectors of the economy, a consensus was created about the broad lines of liberalization. As the main elements of this reform must constitute parts of any reasonable future reform of the cap in the EU, it might be worth mentioning them here. The basic idea behind the reform is, uh, is mirroring or echoing what Jagdish said. Uh, if you have one goal, you must have one instrument. The policy we had and we have now in, in the EU is that you, you, the special interests, they put forward a whole bunch of different goals and have one instrument, high price. And what were the, uh, the different uh, goals? Well, uh, Nash, safety of supply. Uh, we, uh, we were preparing for a, uh, the last war, as it were, I mean, a, a perfect isolation or a, a, a situation of war. Uh, so we had, uh, we had uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the framework of the national defense planning, we had stocks uh, of food. The problem was that the stocks were enough for three years complete isolation, whereas the military defense was uh, calibrated for some two to three weeks. So the only logical conclusion was that uh, when the uh, enemy had occupied us, we would, um, we would uh, kill him off by having him eating himself to death. Uh, now, um, uh, this, uh, of course, um, um, uh, we could show was uh, nonsensical. The income goal target uh, we already I already mentioned. Uh, we demonstrated that uh, that uh, there was no even if we wanted we couldn't steer the income of the labor in that sector because that would depend on on productivity and and relative wages in other sectors. Uh, if uh, if income was pushed up, uh, people would flow into the sector and lower the the real wage. Um, and um, what, what was left was, an in uh, the main components of the reform, was an internal liberalization. We couldn't go so far as, as tearing down the tariff uh, uh, walls because of the, uh, the dumping on the world market. That would absolutely eliminate uh, the, uh, the Swedish agriculture. In a free mark world market, a uh, sizable part of the Swedish agriculture would survive anyway. But we couldn't go that far. But we, we took away all the price regulations internally, established a free pricing market. We uh, uh, maintained the, the border protection, as I said. Uh, we tried to create the even playing field between agriculture and other rural activities. And, uh, and then we had the element of, uh, of paying them off, an adjustment 
payment over a five-year period. And then if, if the general public, the voters, wanted to maintain the countryside open, yes, by all means, you could set aside money for that. On market terms, you could uh, purchase these services from the farmers, thereby keeping up the, the environment and, uh, and, uh, or the, the landscape. And of course, this, re this reform would lead to a lower level of subsidization and therefore an increased environment through lower inputs of pesticides and fertilizers. The main method here to fight the special interest was to, to show the, the evidence uh, on each particular point. Uh, but I have to admit uh, that was not enough. You also must have uh, politicians who are uh, sufficiently devoted to the general interest and prepared to fight for it. And that we had at that time. Uh, so I guess the main conclusion is that one, one important step you can take is to vote for people into political power who are declaring their solidarity with the general interest and not with special interest. Now, finally, I would like to turn to those issues I indicated at the beginning as truly global in na nature, namely the environmental problems which do affect all of us on the earth, this earth. Among the more dramatic problems in this field are the depletion of the ozone layer and the global warming or climate change. Each of these areas have been treated by the international community in a number of conferences. From the analytical point of view, these problems are cases of negative environmental externalities, or inversely, if we think positively, reduction of pollution as a kind of public good, which has been dealt with at the national level in different ways, mainly by regulation, taxes and subsidies, or establishing property rights, which has led to the cost of the damage on the environment being internalized in the process of production or consumption. Example of these policies are regulation of car exhausts and trade in defined emission rights, for example. The first environmental threat on a global scale to be dealt with relatively effectively was the depletion of the ozone layer. After years of controversy around the scientific evidence, a broad consensus was established that indeed the CFCs were having the dangerous uh, effects that controversial scientists like Paul Crutzen, Mario Molina, and Sherwood Rowland were predicting, and for which they were awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1995. The preparedness to go from words to deeds gained momentum, and the Mo Montreal Convention in 1987 was ratified by a large number of countries. This convention is considered to be a success with relative rapid implementation of the goals to stop the use of ozone-destroying substances. Several factors contributed to this result. The general public was made aware of the threat in a rel relatively clear way. The diplomats succeeded in designing a treaty with both sticks and carrots for poorer countries and potential free riders. And last but not least, even conservative cost-benefit analysis showed the present value of the benefits by far exceeding the cost. Well, you, don't, you are probably not able to see any of the figures here, but uh, if you trust me, they, uh, they show you that the, the benefits are widely greater than the cost uh, to, to stop the use of, uh, of, uh, of these substances, the CFCs. And uh, these calculations were uh, made, or, or the, the, uh, the results became off ex post after the event. Uh, even more favorable due to the technological development of substitutes for the CFCs. So um, that's one, of course, important reason for the relatively swift action by the international community on this, this uh, account. Uh, for the greenhouse gases which contribute to the warming of the global climate, a convention was elaborated finally in Kyoto in 1997. But here the political support has been much more lukewarm and one has not yet reached the two 55% thresholds. That is 55% of both industrial, industrialized countries having ratified and 55% of the emission quantities being covered, which are stipulated in order for the convention to enter into force. The slow progress in modifying the influence of man on climate is explained by several circumstances. 
First, the factual assessment has been more controversial uh, and or uncertain as there have been natural fluctuations in the climate over the very long history of Earth. Uh, here we have a uh, time horizon from year 1000, or well, last thousand years, and um, one sees the, the great fluctuations which are more or less natural. You also see the, the trend upwards at, during the, the last century. Um, and uh, the, these fluctuations are, are uh, prompted by both external cosmic influences as well as terrestrial phenomena like volcano eruptions. Over the last century, the warming accounted, amounted to 0.6 degrees Celsius, out of which 0.3 to 0.4 takes place in the second half of the century. Two clearly warmer periods uh, are distinguishable. 1910 to 45, and from 1975 to the present day. Whereas the earlier periods could be fitted into models built on natural fluctuations, the latter is not possible to explain without entering anthropogenic factors or man-made factors. It's also clear from the exa examination of the, the carbon dioxide concentrations in the Antarctic ices. This is this. Here, the, the time span is 400,000 years. Um, uh, it's clear that the Earth has not held so high levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for, for this whole period as it does now. In a shorter and more fathomable time perspective, the last 150 uh, to 200 years, the level of CO2 has risen from 270 to 280 parts per million of volume to some 370. There now. These are our uh, data from from uh, investigations of ice. Um, the the however the projections of the effects of this are uh, very uncertain, and that has of course contributed to the the slower progress on this account, and also the cost benefit studies, which again are almost impossible to see, but. The long and short of this table is that uh, there's a wide margin between the uh, very wide span between the different cost benefits results, and uh, there are a number of uh, uh, factors which uh, primarily the discount rate that we should discount the future, which influences the results. The late latest projections however, give a wider span of possible or probable rises in the temperature than previously. Uh, this is a uh, result from the uh, International Panel on Climate Change. Uh, if uh, the earlier span was a rise by one to th three and a half centigrades to the year two 2100, uh, the span now is between one and five centigrades. The consequences of these temperature increases are very uncertain, of course. For Sweden, the prospect of a somewhat warmer climate seems, for example, a quite attractive thought, particularly in comparison with the scenarios for Africa and Southern Europe, until, which, of course, would suffer a lot by higher temperatures. And this is, seems nice until the specter is evoked of the Gulf Stream being deflected by the Arctic ice melting in a way that would lead to a new ice period in Scandinavia. My reading of this latest assessment is that on balance, the benefits of measures limiting the greenhouse gases ought to have increased. And one would hope that the thresholds of the Kyoto Convention will be reached at the follow-up conference, which starts in, at The Hague next month. The environmental problems which the inter international community is facing is only one aspect of a more general need to establish institutions and rules of the game for the international interaction, which would take care of the externalities, both negative and positive. If the environmental externalis externalities are of a negative kind, positive externalities or global public goods can be illustrated by the establishment of clear property rights and or standards for the economic interaction, for example, in the international financial markets.
Within the nation states, such rules of the game have been developed by local or national governments. At the international level, the closest one can come to global authority is the UN system. But as we all know, the power and efficiency of this system is weak, and the capacity of enforcement is limited by mainly the unwillingness of nation states for a number of good and some bad reasons to give up their sovereignty. Even in extreme cases of infringement of the Declaration of Human Rights, one of the rules of the game, the authority of the UN has been severely hampered by the refusal by major countries to give the UN a greater role. Behind the resistance to, glo resistance to global governance, you can find both the fear that a more strict implementation of UN principles could affect the freedom to suppress or maltreat parts of your own population. After all, despite this all globalization, large parts of humanity do still not live in democracies. And in the democracies, the general public is not too enthusiastic about footing the bill in terms of human and financial resources in order to give the UN the necessary clout. I might add, at the risk of being impertinent, that the UN is a slightly odd club where the wealthiest member of the club attends all the lunches and the dinners and even some of the club outings, but is constantly delayed in with paying the annual membership fee. The, uh, the, the, present, well, the uh, present UN system is a very extensive organizational structure which you can study on the Na United Nations website. But in order to convey a more realistic vision of the reality, I've chosen this symbolic vision of the global government under construction. That is uh, the Tower of Babel, as Peter Bergel saw it in 1563. The UN system is vast, but that the as the case was with the Tower of Babel, people speak too many languages without understanding each other, or more precisely, the different parts of the system are very poorly coordinated. As far as I can understand, it is more a rule than exception that, for example, the United Nations General Assembly or other its committees discuss matters of trade, investment or globalization without having any dialogue or interaction with the specialized agencies like the WTO. Sometimes the conditions within the specialized agencies have been such that you would need the combined literary capacity of a Niccolo Machiavelli, a Jonathan Swift, and a Franz Kafka to make full justice to what was going on. And I, we, we have heard something of this um, today, I think. <clears throat> One example, clearly not the worst, but difficult enough for taxpayers to understand, is the constant problem of establishing a good working climate between the IMF and the World Bank in, in operational terms, located as they are not only in the same city but in the immediate vicinity of each other. The blame for the poor governance, and this has already been underlined, of the, the global system and the UN system should not primarily be put on those institutions as such, but on the owners, that is the member governments and their inability to coordinate their policies. The G Secretary General, Kofi Annan, who is one of the most impressive of the statesmen who have been entrusted with this almost impossible post, is waging a reform campaign, which one can hope will be successful, but even so the idea of a government, a world government is clearly something for the very, very long run. But the need to address and cope with the problems like the global environment or the stability of financial markets is there today. What can realistically be achieved in order to strengthen the international system in the near future? One necessary line of action is to enhance the coordination between the existing organizations, fora and institutions and establish clear property right, rights, as it were, or demarcation of responsibility between the relevant agencies. Another way to put it is that the principle of comparative advantage should be applied also to the producers of global public goods within the UN system. With such an approach, environmental questions would, as also Yagish Bhagwati has said, would primarily be dealt with by, by the United Nations uh, Environment Program and perhaps the World Bank. Uh, trade policies would be the main responsibility by the WTO and the in the financial area it would be the IMF, the BIS, Bank for International Settlements, and the Financial Stability Forum which would be responsible. Whereas uh, questions relating to corporate governance and the fight against corruption come under the OECD and the World Bank. This division of labor is nothing new in principle. But the new element would consist of enhanced cooperation in implementing existing or developing new rules. Through a simultaneous moral suasion 
or political peer pressure in several fora, free riders could be stimulated to comply with the rules of the game in the respective area. In this ganging up process, the financial agencies clearly have a special weight. At the same time, it's very important that the distinction is maintained between the standard setting bodies and the other UN bodies. To take an example, it's very important not to burden the WTO with new rules which would open the gates for more or less disguised protectionism, or to avoid the risk that IMF would be further pushed into the direction of wider foreign policy making with limited relevance to the fund's basic tasks in the financial and balance of payments fields. In the environmental field, a major instrument for international norm setting have been the respective conventions. Much could be said about their lack of sanctions and therefore low efficiency, but they, they constitute a basis for further political pressure in order to get greater compliance and for the operational policies of the, devel the development agencies. So if one should conclude on a positive note, what, can one one, what one can hope for is a gradual development where existing agencies and bodies are made more efficient and cooperation between them is enhanced, where the system of international rules producing global good, public goods is gradually expanded. Instead of one single political, legal and administrative edifice like the Tower of Babel, one would see a pattern where the different configurations gradually come closer to each other and more and more solid ground is created. In conclusion, or to sum up the different dishes I have offered you on this smorgasbord board of different reflections, I have tried to put the notion of globalization into a historical perspective, which makes its ingredients less new and less homogeneous, and therefore perhaps less scaring. The globalization offers enormous positive possibilities for international political, economic, technological, and cultural integration. But how these possibilities are realized is still to a very high degree in the hands of the nation state, or at least those states with ha which have functioning governments, which are not all states. On closer inspection, the trade integration during the decade of globalized liberalization turns out to have been considerably less far-reaching than generally perceived. And within the current set of policies, I've tried to point to the impressive potential for increasing welfare in both rich and poor countries you will find, if you care to look at what the special invested interests have been able to appropriate for themselves. The really global problems in the stricter sense of the word concerns the environment on this earth. Here I have con concentrated on the ozone layer and the climate change, but there are other pressing or rather depressing issues like the decreasing biodiversity and the persist persistent organic pollutants uh, which have to be dealt with. In order to solve these and other international problems, a strengthened system of governance is needed, but at best we can only expect gradual progress and to conclude in a, in a way which is conformed with the, the ethos of the profession, the Dismal scientist, uh, the risk is with collective action that the action uh, will be too little and too late. Thank you very much. For one last time, we'll gather up here for some questions. If you have questions, if you have questions, uh, you can write them on paper and give them to our ushers.
I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. mention it. Once again, we ask that you, as expeditiously as possible, uh, those of you who might wish to submit a question for our speaker, that you deliver that question to one of the ushers picking those up, and we'll get the Q&A portion of the program underway promptly so as not to be further delayed in conclusion. Can, can I start with one? <clears throat> yes. Here's the first question. In 1991, while in Sweden, our family there informed us that Sweden was the largest importer of bananas in the world. That uh, weekly banana boats arrived in Göteborg to satisfy the need of Swedish people for bananas. Is this still true and where do you buy them? <laughs> well, um, I, 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 I can't possibly believe we were the biggest importer in the world, but per capita consumption was, uh -huh. uh, was the highest. That, that. Um, because uh, Germany <laughs> is also a big banana eater. And, uh, and uh, well, we get them, this system is uh, operated now, so we get uh, both, both bananas from, uh, well, mainly we get bananas from, from, not from the Caribbean supported countries. Uh, but the, the, my point is that this is a very transparent deal which uh, confers great, great rents on, on, on people who are not supposed to be supported. But we still have bananas in, in, uh, imported to Sweden, yes. You, you want me to, yes. um, I was asked to fill in the time, so let me just say, <laughs> I was fascinated by the uh, the last part of what you were saying when you were indicating the multiple needs that we have to manage the international community and uh, how we need to do that in somewhat separated ways. Obviously, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not saying that's not right. I'm also going to express concern that unless there is some integration among these, then the one they may operate at somewhat cross purposes. I mean, for example, you were indicating that the trade organization should deal only with trade issues, and then the, the environmental concerns would be dealt with by international conferences. So if we just bring these two together, does that mean that the only aspect of environmental concerns that could play any role in trade thinking would be those that had been, become internationally accepted through these conferences. So that it, I, I think you are saying that, that, that trade issues should not take account of environmental concerns except under very special circumstances. Is that, is that your view? Well, I, I, my point is uh, almost the same as Professor Bhagwati was making, that uh, one should try to devise one instrument for one goal, and for each goal. Yeah. And uh, the role of WTO is to liberalize trade and uh, possibly establish then what is pos acceptable rules, how to deal with, with other issues. But the, uh, the standards, etc., should be set by those working with environmental problems within the UNEP, for example, uh, or ILO when it comes to workers' rights and so on. But I mean, it's so obvious that, uh, that these issues are pushed not only for for the good reasons, but also for protectionist reasons, uh, those other, other goals. And, and are you saying that it is because they are pushed for protectionist reasons that they should not be considered in trade negotiations? Well, exactly, exactly. Even though, so that we shouldn't push them for good reasons because somebody else might push them for bad reasons. No, you should put, push them in the appropriate forum, as it were. Of course, there should be some kind yeah. of coordination or in, I improved uh, exchange of information between the, the agencies. That's one point. Yeah. I mean. But uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the division of labor is a good principle uh, even in this field. But uh, division of labor works better if there is relative equality in power among the various groups. At the present time, that's not the general impression with respect to the trade organization has more power to push its goal than the others do to push their goals in general. Is that not the case? Well, well uh, Professor Bhagwati is, um, <coughs> is an expert on this. Uh, yes. no. <clears throat> I mean, the, the reason why you think WTO has more power is because 
of the regular, you know, because of the dispute settlement mechanism. But I, there's no reason why. I mean, it, that's only enforcing whatever is agreed to. So I think what Mr. Zolman is basically saying is that well, there's a necessary interface. Obviously, the organizations have to talk with each other. Like on the question which some, I think Joe Stiglitz was you know, raising about the multilateral environmental agreements, <clears throat> since many of them do have trade sanctions, <clears throat> clearly there could be a potential conflict with the WTO rules. So that would have to be negotiated together, naturally. Again, on you know, values related to uh, you know, like dolphin tuna, shrimp turtle, those, those in turn, I think, are better negotiate how to deal with them, like the Kyoto Agreement. So clearly, you know, some thinking would have to go, be going back and forth. But once you've done that, you know, the, the principle of comparative advantage applies to massive amounts of things, right? So, so the, the basic thrust of the governance could, would be what Mr. Solman is saying, with necessary, you know, talks, interactions, including parallel uh, talks with civil society and so on going on. Question that may cross the boundaries of the two topics that we have just been discussing. Is there a connection between agricultural production and the prevention of the environmental problems you discussed? Does changing the cap contribute to or alleviate environmental degradation? Oh, yes, very much so. The, um, if I, this was some time I worked with these questions, but uh, if I rem remember cor correctly, in, in um, cereals production, you make something like two tons per hectare in the United States. And uh, in, uh, in comparable circumstances in uh, Europe, uh, production is pu pushed up to the level of 8, 10 tons per hectare through the input of huge quantities of fertilizers and, and pesticides. And this then uh, leads to, uh, to an over-fertilization of, of uh, rivers and lakes and, and the sea and, o and also has other environmental effects. And uh, a lowering of the intensity should benefit uh, the, uh, the, uh, the environment uh, quite a lot. Uh, in in uh, particularly in the cent Central Europe and con on the continent. This question they ask, after decades of liberal social government, are there any poor in Sweden? Do they have <coughs> a political role? Are there any poor in Sweden? Well, uh, it's a relative uh, concept. Uh, there are people who uh, who, uh, well, the poor are the, the immigrants which still have not got jobs and are waiting for jobs. That's the main, main part. Uh, um, single mothers are also another group which has been under certain pressure during the, uh, the first, well, during the most of the 90s, we have been through a, a, a first the economic crisis and then the recovery. And uh, here, uh, some people have fared less well, but in relation to uh, the kind of, of poor we're talking about today, uh, we don't have it. And you compare with, the, with the, the level of, of living standards of poor in the developing world. Nobody's starving, etc. So. Please comment on the outside capital purchasing, inter purchasing interest in the auto and copper industry. Sorry. Please comment on the outside capital purchasing interest in the auto and copper industry. What does that mean? Well, the, the auto industry, that's Volvo and Saab. And, uh, uh, they have been uh, purchased by uh, U.S. companies or the, the car part of, uh, of uh, Volvo and, uh, and the same for uh, Saab Scania. Well, uh, uh, that wasn't what uh, Swedes would have expected 10 or 20 years ago, but that's the fact of life and, uh, and it seems to work quite well. We are specializing the, the car, Swedish car industry is uh, sort of retreating to the higher levels of value added uh, by, uh, by being very big in the, in the truck construction business instead. 
Volvo and Scania, both of them. I, I, would, I should add, uh, from an economist's point of view, Sweden, uh, when we talk about poor and the distribution of incomes, uh, we have the, the, the most equal Gini coefficient, uh, uh, I think, among the industrialized world. That has changed somewhat over the 90s. Uh, it's slightly uh, lower or higher, I don't remember the figures now. Uh, but uh, due to these uh, developments, uh, higher unemployment for a certain period of time, we're still, I think, on the t very top of uh, income uh, equality. Well, on that note, I think we'll close the Q&A for this session, unless there are some final summary comments from any of the rest of the members of the panel. Thank you. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, thank you all. You've been a remarkably loyal audience. Uh, I'll remind you, those of you who are attending the banquet, that begins at 6.30 this evening. It's in the Evelyn Young Dining Room. And Dr. Etzioni's talk will begin probably about 7.45. And if you'd like to join us, even though you don't have tickets for dinner, you're welcome to come to the dining room at 7.30, and we'll have a place for you to sit. Thank you very much.